This is, uh, in truth, a, a method that I've been wanting to use at the webinar uh, for a long time, and I just never got around to it. And uh, <clears throat> so I, it, it, I, I'm just happy to have the experience with people who know what they're doing or what they're talking about anyway when it comes to, comes to, uh, comes to this kind of stuff. I want to tell you just for a second about the Better Business Bureau. We are a, uh, about a 115, 110-15-year-old organization. We were started by the Advertising League, of all things, in Minneapolis in about 1910 or, or 7 or 8, actually, when it really got, got going. It was, it was done because of uh, false advertising. It was done because, because business people were getting hammered by what competitors were saying, legitimate business people were getting hammered by what uh, phonies, the crooks, the con men, or just the misleading advertisers were doing. And it was, and it was ripping up the marketplace and destroying consumer trust. Uh, back then, they didn't quite know that it was consumer trust at that time. And a guy who really got it going was a fellow named Sam Dobbs. And I think it was, not, uh, it was uh, 1906. He was, the, he was the general sales manager over all sales for Coca-Cola. And Coke, for some reason, was being sued by the, by the federal government over some things, probably health claims, in uh, Coca-Cola, uh, saying that they, were, that they were false claims. So as the trial progressed, Coke's ad agency and their attorneys said, well, listen, we know how this is. Nobody really cares what's said in advertising. Nobody believes it. So it's just done to transmit an idea. Dobbs heard that. He was sitting in the courtroom. And he said, wait a minute. I want my customers to be able to believe what I say in advertising. And that was really the genesis of it all. This, this one guy with this one idea. And then he got with the Advertising League in Minneapolis. And they started to talk about this idea of self-regulation of the marketplace. Who better knows truthful advertising than truthful advertisers? Who better knows what can be said about Oh, I don't know. Think about what we're going to start seeing here. Maybe we've already started seeing it. Uh, the ads in the paper or in magazines or even on TV for above ground pools where they'll show maybe 10, 12 people, maybe even a porpoise swimming around, and that pool is going to sell for $998 or whatever the price may be. There's no way in the world that can happen at that price. And that just leads to leads to bait and switch advertising, and it's and that's, that kind of stuff just destroys customer belief and in the value of advertising and in the truthfulness of business. We just had a thing here in Richmond. Uh, I think it was on Monday. The Attorney General uh, announced a settlement with the tire business here for bait-and-switch advertising, advertising stuff that they didn't have, uh, couldn't do, couldn't perform, and customers were going in, being led into this business to buy the stuff. They were trying to buy it, and they couldn't, or they would be dissuaded away from it. It's, i got to tell you that it's rare to see in this day and age an attorney general actually taking that action. That's a great thing, and, and the folks who will really benefit out of that are the legitimate tire advertisers, the folks who are, who are just trying to get by. Running a sale, the sale will start week one, and it runs for two and a half weeks, and it ends, and the prices go back up. The definition of a sale really is that it has a date when it starts and a date when it ends, and the price is lowered in the meantime. All that just sort of captures how the BBBs got started. Somehow, uh, in the early, late teens, 19s, uh, and 20s, we started handling complaints. Uh, and uh, based on the idea that, uh, that folks had, and, and, and of course the advertisers and the early Better Business Bureaus were asking for comment and input from consumers in the marketplace. And, cons and that, that all started really because folks became aware of the work of this independent organization. And, and, uh, and the concept and all in back of it is trust. And trust really is the backbone, I think, of the marketplace. The seller needs to believe that the buyer is going to pay. The buyer needs to believe that the seller is going to provide the product. And that's really how it gets going. So we are not a government agency. We don't have any connection to the government agency. We do. We, we, we interface closely with with law enforcement, things that we've become aware of, we'll share with the uh, with the attorney general or the, the FBI or the local police department or the postal inspectors or IRS or something like that. But all of our dues, all of our all of our revenue, 
with the exception once in a while of a grant, come from businesses. And businesses pay dues to belong to Better Business Bureau. They have an, a fee, and that pays for their accreditation. In Central Virginia, we've got between 4,700 and 4,800 companies who, uh, who are accredited by BBB. And, and, uh, uh, and it's, it's just, it's that, and that pays about two and a half million dollars. So I want to, I want to get going a little bit with the, with what we've done here. I want to talk about what our mission statement is for the Better Business Bureau. And remember, we are standards based. Everything that we talk about is all standards of the Better Business Bureau. By the reason, and how we want to do this, uh, in, in advancing marketplace trust is by setting standards for marketplace trust. Encouraging and supporting best practices, celebrating marketplace role models, the really good companies, denouncing substandard, substandard marketplace behavior, and nurturing a community of trustworthy businesses. That's really what the, the bottom one there is, is so critical, that we have, a, have this, this community of trustworthy businesses. I have this dream sometime between now and well, whenever I leave that that the Central Virginia area, people won't want to come in here on phones and, and emails and such all the time because we have a reputation for trust and consumers and businesses readily understanding that they can trust uh, the folks with whom they're doing business. Our values are excellence. We strive to do our very best uh, uh, with commitment and accountability. Integrity to be honest and ethical in all activities have the courage to do right, teamwork, communicate, cooperate, and collaborate. That you can trust what the BBB says, say what we mean and mean what we say, and respect. Treat everyone with respect and dignity. Now, if we take this out to the business community, <clears throat> to our accredited businesses, this is a pretty good starting place for businesses. Strive to do the very best with a commitment and accountable, be accountable to your customers, be accountable to your employees. You operate with integrity. You're honest. You're ethical in all activities. You have the courage to do right, and it, it is sometimes it really does take courage. And teamwork. You're going to communicate with your own folks, cooperate and collaborate. There needs to be trust everywhere around. Say what you mean, mean what you say, and treat everyone with respect and dignity. Now, the BBB standards for trust are eight principles that summarize important elements of creating and maintaining trust in business. This is, the, this is the codification of what we try to get to with our own standards. Number one, build trust. Establish and maintain a positive track record in the marketplace. I have to tell you, I don't care if a company gets complaints. I really don't. I do care when the company doesn't adjust it or when the company does adjust the complaint. Nobody's going to be perfect, and sometimes things go bad with a you get a bad salesperson, or you get a you get a bad product, or or sometimes you even get customers that aren't those folks that you might want to be dealing with. The idea is is if you have a problem, take care of it, operate with trust. That's the whole ballgame right there. Advertise honestly. Adhere to established standards of advertising and selling. Now. When I first started working for BBB, it was actually in 1969 up in Philly, we had a, we had a book. We had a whole big thing. It was called, um, the hell was it? Anyway, it was the, uh, a guide for advertising. It was one of those loose sleep binders that had, I don't know how big the rings were on it, but the book itself was about six inches thick, and it was in a loose sleeve. It, it just spelled out everything about uh, some of the things were, were very, very interesting. We would get into get into cases. Some of uh, w uh, was about. I remember one in particular back in the late '60s, early '70s that had to do with creaseless eyeshadow. Now, why in the world would we care about? Well, I'll tell you who cares about it. Maybelline does if they're competing with one of the other one of the other uh, 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 makeup manufacturers. It's a very big deal. Uh, the uh, Bates which advertising, constantly having things on sale. That's what we're asking for. You know, when I started looking, when I started the game, it was uh, uh, all out of this, this whole great big book. 
but the burden, but the but the simple manner, the simple standard that we had, we could condense it all down to one sentence. The burden of proof is on the advertiser. The burden of proof in any transaction is on the advertiser. If you're going to place an ad, if you're going to say that you can do something, that you're going to produce something, then you have to be able to do that. If you're going to say that we got the lowest prices in town, then you got to have them. If you're going to say you're never going to be undersold, then you never got to be undersold. Now, I don't know how you can make those claims. I've always wanted to, uh, I have this little idea in my head of something fun to do, would be when somebody in the, in the Sunday newspaper is advertising, we're selling a, a mouse for uh, $28. We will never be undersold on that mouse, ever. And then the next ad, right alongside of it, or the next pack, uh, thing says, we've got the lowest prices in town. And then you go back to these two advertisers and say, okay, well, who's telling the truth? This guy here says he's never going to be undersold, and this guy over here says he's got the lowest prices in town. You need to be able to back up your advertising. So company number one, you sold it to me for $28. How about if you give me a reduction to $26? Because you're never, you're, what is it? You've got, you're never going to be undersold. Company number two, you got the lowest prices in town. You actually need to take my price down to $24. And then I go back across the street and get my price reduced again. I always thought that would be a fun exercise to do. And maybe I can get a group of interns from University of Richmond or, or VCU or someplace to do that for me. Um, it would just be a fun thing to do. I don't know what I'd get out of it except satisfaction. Tell the truth. Honestly represent products and services including clear and adequate disclosures of all material terms. I have a personal book. I, I race sailboats. It's, it's my fun. I'm always looking for the ideal waterproof windbreaker. I've come to believe that in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the average person's inventory, there is no such thing as a reasonably priced waterproof windbreaker. Now, you see that Excuse me. You see the ad for the windbreaker. You see the on the display at the store, and it says waterproof, or it might just say windproof, or it might just say water and windproof, or it might just say water resistant and windproof. Water resistant don't work. That is not waterproof. That and I find that on a, not an irregular basis, uh, going back and forth. Where where if you're going to advertise it, it's got to be waterproof if you're going to say that. And, and we are reasonably successful in when we get a hold of an advertiser, when that's now, now another problem that's happened just in the last period of last, what, 10 years, <clears throat> excuse me, this huge influx of national change, uh, national chains and the, and the diminution of, in, in, of uh, in the marketplace of locally owned businesses. It's very hard for a locally owned operator to operate in a very, very clean advertising way when the national chain is advertising, saying all kinds of things in advertising that may not be true. We'll go, we'll communicate with the national advertiser, but it's kind of tough to do. We have two companies headquartered in Richmond uh, that are really good companies. They both generate complaints. One is Capital One, the credit card company. Another one is CarMax, the uh, used car retailer. And we'll get complaints about these guys, uh, not on an irregular basis. You know, with Capital One, we'll get a couple thousand a year. That's a lot of complaints for us. But when you think they have 45, 46 million credit cards out on the street, that's 45, 46 million bills going out every month, 45, 46 million checks coming back every month. The numbers that they provide us with are minuscule. And the same with CarMax. They advertise what they have. They sell what they have and they have the sales to prove that it works. So uh, they're honestly representing the product. CarMax are going to tell you, I don't know what the warrant will get. We'll get you a warranty on this car, and that's, uh, and that's uh, the best we can do. We believe it's a good car. That's, I'm not sure how much more you can ask for. Be transparent. Openly identify the nature, location, and ownership of the business, and clearly disclose all policies, guarantees, procedures that bear on a customer's decision to buy. I don't know what we're going to do with this with this standard. Openly identify the location. Now that we have so many companies operating out of a 
uh, online. Some operate out of a garage. Some operate out of an office complex. Some operate out of a, a, a monthly rental place or a storage facility. They're everywhere. That makes it a tough thing to do. I can tell you that every accredited business is uh, business that we have as a, as a member supporting uh, company, we know exactly where they are and when they're there. We know if they're operating out of a out of a storage unit, which they do sometimes uh, in the in the direct mail business and in the uh, fulfillment business. Uh, the ownership of the business is something I'm not. We we need to know that. I don't know how how much the uh, consumer needs, the ultimate uh, uh, buyer needs to know. But clearly disclose all policies, guarantees, and procedures. How about a return policy? You're buying it. Yeah, I'm buying something from this company, and 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 let's say that we're buying it at, uh, uh, I guess Best Products. Well, not Best Products. What am I thinking of? Uh, one of one of the online, one of the one of the uh, electronic retailers. Um, if you buy a TV there. They might not want you to bring that TV back there if it doesn't work, or a computer, or whatever. They might want you to send that. You, you take the responsibility of sending that to a third party, perhaps the manufacturer, perhaps a service center, maybe only to Amazon. That would be pretty easy. But that's important to me when I buy that. If I want to bring it back, what do I do about it? How does it work, and is it going to cost me money? And what is involved with it? I've restricted my purchasing uh, in large stores anyway, only to those places that I know are not going to give me a hassle if for some reason I have to bring it back. I, I, I will grant you that I have a distinct advantage when I can go to our files and look at it. But by the way, you can too. Just go to bbb.org, and it'll direct you to your local Better Business Bureau pretty much by where your zip code is. And then put in the name of the company and bring it up, and bring it up as best you can. You can read what the company's report is, how many complaints they have, what the complaints say, uh, and how they adjusted it. I, I, I said, I really don't care if a company gets complaints. Not a lot of them. I'm not talking about a lot. Or if they don't answer them. But I am very interested that they be adjusted. And that, that information is available to everybody who uses uh, BBB services. Honor promises. Do what you say you're going to. What you said you were going to do. Abide by all written agreements and verbal representations. We all know people that we like to do business with, and we all know people. I would suppose that we won't go back to again because they didn't abide by a verbal representation that was made. Written agreements are pretty simple. Uh, verbal representations are tougher to come by, and that's where you have to deal with uh, uh, getting the reputation of a company. I wouldn't believe any verbal representation. I just don't. I don't. But I, I, I sure do like knowing the people uh, that I'm dealing with. And I think that I have a, uh, a, a pretty good track record of being able to, to, to handle folks and, what their, and what, their, uh, what their policies are. It's critical. This next standard is be responsive. Uh, address marketplace disputes quickly professionally and in good faith. And remember, this is for our accredited businesses. And, and, and if somebody's going to have a BBB logo on their site, on their website, on their, uh, on their printed materials, we want them, just for the good of the Better Business Bureau, not only them, to take care of their problems quickly and professionally and in good faith. Anytime, anytime, we all know this, I'm sure that we all have, have customers, or even if it's an internal customer, that if there's a problem, if you get back quickly, if you address them quickly, even if you can't take care of it, if you do it quickly, um, uh, you, you're so much better off. Problems just don't start. It's like the old thing, if you take care of the little problems, big problems simply don't happen. Anybody can get it wrong. but. If you're able to get it taken care of quickly, that's a great thing. And, and even if you tell somebody no, tell me yes, tell me no. Just tell me. And I can deal with it. I can live with that. And, and uh, uh, so what do we got next here? Yeah. Safeguard privacy. Now, in the, in the online environment, I mean, take a look at what's happened with Home Depot. 
Take a look at what's happened with Target or Anthem. We need, as in, in my case, I've got 4,700 companies that that are that are, are accredited business with us, and we have thousands of complaints and complainants that have come in over the years. We only keep them for three years, but that's 30, 40,000 complaints that we're storing here that we need to keep uh, uh, safeguarded, protect any data collected against mishandling and fraud, collect personal information only as needed, and respect the preferences of customers regarding the use of their information. Don't give their information to somebody else if the customer doesn't know it. Don't do that. It, it's uh, to me now. Uh, it's an infringement on my, on my, on my privacy rights. And I think to all of us as individuals, we don't want anybody using our information if we didn't give them specific information and per permission to do that. That's such a big deal. It's and it's just it's just the right. And embody integrity. If we do the things that are above us uh, that we talked about, approach all deal all, all business dealings marketplace transactions, and commitments with integrity. Just look somebody in the eye and tell them what it's going to be. Well, now, hopefully, we can look people in the eye and tell them that. If we can't, do it in writing, and always do it with the best of intentions. It's a separator in the marketplace. Reputation is what we have. It's all we have. The only thing that separates us from another not-for-profit, the only thing that separates anybody on this from another company doing the same thing is your reputation, it's your integrity, it's that people understand and know that they can deal with you in a, in a, in a competent manner that you're going to take care of their, of, of their things. Uh, I want to talk just for a second about, we also have extensive standards for charities. And I just want to go over this, that, uh, that, are, that are reasonably, reasonably, they make sense, but boy, they sure don't live, or they sure aren't spread around that thickly. Every, every not-for-profit needs to have, every charity needs to have a board of directors that provides adequate oversight of the charity's operations in the staff. And a board has to have at least five voting members. There's some very, very, very small places around. There's some that are driven by family interests. You just can't do that. If you're asking someone for a charitable contribution, then there need to be there needs to be safeguards out there and, and an honest report. In finance, we need to spend at least 35% of total expenses on program activities. You know, that's, that sounds like a small amount of money. What about the other 35%? Aren't you just sanctioning uh, people to spend too much money in, in uh, raising the money or in, in running it? No, I don't believe so at all. If, you, if we find a charity, I'm on the board of another, of another charity, uh, of a charity, where we don't spend a dime. We started the thing operating off of all contributions. Uh, we are able to get money contributed to cover overhead expenses. And every dime that a regular con contributor makes uh, goes to the purpose intended. That's rare. We have a hundred, one, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the directors is the CEO of a large organization. He can supply... Uh, administrative support. He can, uh, another person can supply uh, banking support. So we're not faced with uh, what the ordinary run-of-the-mill charity is faced with. But if you see somebody advertising that there's, or, or, or promoting that there is no overhead or there are no costs, just go the other direction. It doesn't work that way. That's uh, normal. That's close to what I wanted to say. I've got a lot more that I can say. And uh, I'm, I'm I'm delighted to try to answer any questions that I possibly can. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, if anybody has any questions for Tom, uh, please type them up into the chat box. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll take a moment again to remind everybody what the next webinar will be. It will be next Thursday, March the 16th. It is Constraints Management, Lean Principles, Six Sigma, Which is Best, by James Tate, Managing Director of Cogent Mag Management Resources. Uh, that'll be next Thursday. Uh, we're looking to see if there's any questions, and it does not appear that we have any in the chat box. I don't have a chat box. 
Well, we're we're seeing it this side. Uh, okay. There's nothing nothing in it. Uh, I'm going to make the assumption that unless somebody really has a question, I have a question. Oh, we do have a question here. Uh, we'll go ahead go ahead and ask. Hi, Tom. This is uh, Kevin Groff. Uh, I'm here with Norval. Um, I, I have a question about um, what is the accreditation process? Uh, if you could briefly describe how um, somebody sure. is accredited to BB. Sure. The process is, is uh, pretty straightforward. We have we have some rules. One that is changing, pretty much against my uh, uh, my better judgment. But but it's it's an overwhelming thing. You got to be in business for a year. Uh, the reason now remember I've been doing this for a very long time, and and the marketplace has changed. So I'm, I'm I need to change with it. Uh, we're going to drop down to six months, but you have to be in business for at least six months. We have to know who you are, where you are, and what your capabilities are. Um, I can tell you that in so, not much longer than six months, we got, we're going to know if we've got real problems. Certainly by a year, we're going to know if we have problems. Uh, we want to know that, that you are what you say you are, that you are located where you say you are, that your advertising is righteous, uh, and that you, in, in, in the, in the instant when there are customer complaints that come to our attention, and a lot of stuff comes to our attention, that you deal with it proper, properly. Uh, it's it's uh, all of that stuff is so much of it, rather not all of it, but so much of it is is uh, goes back to complaints and complaint activity. Now we're doing more and more B two B, and being B two B people complain. I think just about as much as consumers do. Uh, I used to think that B2B, B and B, or B2B, wouldn't get scammed as much, but that was a long time ago when I thought that. Now I, I now I do think that it's more possible, and as a matter of fact, more probable. And I think that we're all getting more used to checking out a company. We're going online. We're finding out about. Yeah, you know, I have a, I have a, a a company that I checked out. I bought a great big wide screen for our training room, like 12 feet wide and ever how high that is, eight or nine feet high. And I went online to look. Uh, it, it, it was just it's just for for a PowerPoint and such. So I went online. I looked this thing up because it only cost 104 dollars. I said, "Whoa, how's something like that?" And like, so I looked it up, and and there were like five reviews on it. The first one said it was a piece of it was just lousy. It was bad. The guy bought it. Had it delivered to his home. He hung it in his projection room, and it didn't. It didn't do well at all. I'm thinking, what in the world is a guy with a projection room doing buying a $104 screen? The next uh, next three, maybe it was, uh, came up, and they were from business people, and saying it was just absolutely great, which is what I would say about the thing. It didn't cost any money at all, and I don't think we got $150 in it, including including delivery. It's not what I would want if I had a projection room there. Um, just a follow-up question is, uh, yeah. what would be the grounds for uh, termination of your yeah. accreditation? Or? Well, we, we uh, last year, we terminated, I know this because I just, I just had to put it all together. It was 26, uh, uh, 26 companies for membership. The majority, sadly, that's, uh, that's gone up in the last couple of years. The main reason that a company gets terminated as an AB is they 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 don't keep their license up. Uh, this has happened. This is a phenomenon that started, I guess, in 2008, with small contractors having to uh, having they're they're needing to stay in business, but they can't afford to pay for their licenses, their proficiency licenses. I don't care about I don't care about run of the mill uh, business licenses. When you apply and join. Uh, or when you become a credit, then you'll then then we'll double check to be sure that you've got your licenses, all the business licenses. But we're not going to go back and check that every year. So that's uh, a failure. Of, I'm sorry, there were 33, 14 of them over, over half. I'm, I'm sorry, just under half was for failure to maintain proper licensing. Uh, uh, six of them uh, was uh, reflect unfavorably on the Better Business Bureau. They are out there. They're doing. They're they're people that we wouldn't. If we knew who they were, we never would allow them to be members. 
uh, accredited businesses. They could be just doing shady things, borderline things, uh, and we're getting too many complaints. We're getting a pattern of complaints. You know, a pattern of complaints is is uh, is bad. It's almost worse than failure to respond to a complaint. It just simply means that this person, this company here, thinks they can game the system by filing by having complaints filed against them that are the same thing over and over again. And I'm not talking about uh, problems with air conditioning when it's an air conditioning company. That's all you can do. But what would what could fall in would be uh, credit card information that they're not uh, uh, maintaining securely, or or uh, personal information that they're sharing, or that they are uh, repairing the things poorly so that they have to go back again uh, right away. That'll show, I can tell you, that if, if, if it's going to be a pattern, that won't show up only one time. It sets itself, and it shows us the problem. And then, and then the, another 11 of them, uh, of the terminations, didn't answer a comp one complaint, just one complaint, if you don't answer it, we're going to uh, terminate the membership. All of it has to do with the way that you treat your customer. It, it could be uh, government actions. Uh, if you are if you are an AB now, now ABs accredited businesses. We we operate. Our standards when you look up a company, it's either got it can have an A plus all the way down to an F, as uh, as what the what the report is. Just the same thing as in school, and it's and it's. Uh, uh, if the company isn't doing what they ought to be doing, if we question their advertising and they don't resolve it, any of those things can, can just, we'll, we'll terminate the membership. It reflects poorly on the BBB and poorly on, um, uh, on the marketplace when somebody might want to do business with the company and sees that it's an accredited business and it doesn't take care of its stuff, then we don't want them in there. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, Tom, I'm looking in the chat box. Uh, there is a question from Emily Sargent. Uh, her question is, is there an outreach function of BBB focused on the development of this culture? Um, there is. Thanks for asking that, Emily. Um, and it's not anywhere near where it needs to be, and that's part of our, our strategic plan is to go after that and attack it. Um, Right now, I have uh, folks from BBB, some volunteer board members. We got down to a high school uh, about six times in a row just to talk about ethics and ethical behavior. Well, I think we have six classrooms that we're in for six weeks, and uh, that's really, really important because so many of the kids in a high school, and this is a this is a challenging neighborhood. Many of those kids have never heard anybody talk about anything ethical. And we test it when we go in, and we test it when we go out. The kids want to do it's 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 remarkable. Kids are very happy to operate inside of a uh, inside of a set of standards, ethical ethical standards, if they know what that means and if they know how to do it. They're perfectly willing to do that and not try to get over on top of somebody else. Uh, uh, and other BBBs. They're working with colleges. We're just uh, working to establish that now too, where we can go into. I used to go in all a lot into a VCU, uh, into their marketing classes, and just talk about uh, talk about ethics and advertising, and and marketing. And uh, I need to go back to doing that again. I, I I got out of that about three or four years ago. I used to go and lecture also uh, frequently in the law school at University of Richmond. Uh, and I mean, remember, we're not a legal agency, but one professor there, she'd be teaching people tort, which is an uh, infraction and pain, pain uh, to another person or body, uh, that she'd have me come in and talk about, she would have been teaching for a whole semester about what the black letter law says, and then she'd ask me to come in and say what really happens in the marketplace, which an awful lot of stuff that happens is legal, but it sure isn't moral and it sure isn't ethical. And some of this stuff doesn't match up neatly and cleanly with uh, with uh, what law would be, but it affects people negatively. So uh, she come in and have me talk about that. And we always we're always in in schools, uh, uh, in high schools, and then we go out and in, in, in uh, three or four times a week and speak with uh, senior citizens 
older people and, and an increasing number of just uh, younger business people. I've got data that will show that the largest, the single largest group of people getting scammed right now are not senior citizens. They are millennials. And they, they, they fall for a lesser amount of money. The, av the average uh, dollar amount on a millennial scam, if you will, is around $250. The average call uh, that comes in on a, on a on the device that we use, is one of the things is called Scam Tracker. And with seniors, the, uh, while there are fewer, I think it's only like 12 or 15 percent of seniors are reporting, um, it's, it's uh, their average uh, victim victimization is like $390, which, which only is like 140 bucks, but it's a whole lot more than that because that's on an average. And I, see, I just see things that are frightful. So we're working it that way. Thanks, Emily. Okay, Tom, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Oh, yeah, we don't have any. Uh, Emily says, thanks for your good work. You're welcome. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Uh, I don't believe we have any others. So I think with that being said, uh, we'll, we'll thank you once again for uh, giving this talk today. And uh, we'll hopefully see most of you uh, next Thursday, March the 16th, for our next webinar for this month. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and have a good rest of the day. Thanks, Norval. Thanks, folks. Goodbye. Bye now.